Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Uh, it smells really good. So it's up to you. You can have it now or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. So I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> uh, well, good morning, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that. So, especially as we head into the topic of temptation this Sunday. <laughs> Uh, my name is Colton Tatham, and I'm the West Campus Pastor here at Journey Bible Church. Uh, before we get started, I do want to let you guys know that exciting movement is happening for Journey's future campus. Uh, next month, we'll actually be starting West Campus training and practice services over in the warehouse. So if you see activity over there, that's what will be happening. And if you've ever been interested in getting involved, um, now would be a great time to reach out to us. You can either email me or just uh, let us know on a Connect card. Um, if you're not the kind of person who, you know, is really joyful and nice, doesn't really describe you in the morning, especially with kids, um, that's okay. You can come and work with me. Um, we're looking for volunteers who aren't afraid of a little manual labor, labor, I say a little, and they don't like long-term commitment. So it's a perfect position for you to get involved in the church. Uh, we'll teach you how to set up, tear down, and operate all kinds of portable equi equipment over in the warehouse. And with your help, you can help Help our team uh, better prepare to launch um, in a school uh, for weekly worship services on the west side of town in the future. So if you're interested, let me know. So um, with that, uh, let's continue our sermon series on the life of Joseph. So last Sunday, uh, we learned about betrayal and adversity from Pastor Mike. And this Sunday, we're going to unpack what we can kind of learn about facing temptation in Joseph's life. Now, I hope a lot of you have seen the marshmallow test before. Before. I love that video, but if you haven't, it's a really fun test to do with your kids, especially if they're in preschool. 
So first, all you need to do, set a marshmallow, or if your kids aren't into marshmallows, I get, like my wife, put an Oreo cookie out there or some ice cream. And then tell your kid, you know, they can't eat the marshmallow, but they'll get two marshmallows, two marshmallows um, when you come back. Lastly, you're going to set up that video monitor, make sure it's got like, you know, a live TV display in another room. You're going to pop some popcorn and just let the drama unfold for as long as you'd like. I mean, wait until it gets real interesting before you come back into the room. So before I, we start this message off, I, I kind of want to practice just a little bit of lighthearted honesty with the congregation. So I want you to put your imagination caps on and I want you to think back to when you were four and five and there you are. You're at the table, it feels like it's been a long time, and that marshmallow is starting to look really, really tasty, and you start thinking, I wonder if they're really coming back with that other marshmallow, and your hand starts creeping towards it. Confession time, by raise of hands, which of you are the kids that would eat the marshmallow? There we go. We got a lot more marshmallow eaters in second service. So that's, that's great. This message is for you. The rest of you can leave. Just kidding. <laughs> Please don't go. <laughs> so, well, um, uh, as we get started, I, I really wanted to show us the marshmallow test because it, it really teaches all ages about the power of temptation in a way that's safe and fun. Uh, one of the big things that we learn from the marshmallow test is that if you want to overcome temptation, you've got to develop some tactics, maybe to distract yourself or some character traits, something that the Bible calls obedience and the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, the whole book of Genesis, in fact, is all about human beings facing different kinds of temptation. And when we come to the end of Genesis in chapters 37 through 50, we're told a narrative that really shows us two paths. Uh, first, there's the path of godliness, and this is the path Joseph walked. Uh, his life shows us what it's like to control our temptations through patience, self-control, and faithfulness to the Lord. And second, there is the path of the marshmallow eaters, and this is the path of Joseph's brothers. Uh, their lives show us what happens when we let our temptations control us, and it ultimately leads the family into scheming, betrayal, scandal, division, and famine. When it comes to sin and temptation, God's word really calls us all marshmallow eaters in a sense. You know, like impatient preschoolers, we've indulged in something we regret, we've treated others in ways that aren't very kind, and we've acted on impulse rather than in prayer and truth, and it causes us to miss out on what God has in store. Because of this, one of the temptations that we might indulge on the very outset of this sermon is to toy around with the notion that God tempts us. We're actually going to study the character of God in a series later this summer, but what we find in Scripture is very clear. God tempts no one. James 1 reminds us that while God may test us through adversity, that's what we looked at last week, and he does it to refine our faith and to purify our walk, God is never the one tempting us with evil. There's a big distinction. And verses 12 through 15 say, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Again, last week we really learned that God will test us in love. But God will never tempt us in evil. If we're going to learn to face temptation, it's important that we understand that our temptations ultimately come from our own unfulfilled desires. That means that the more that we fulfill ourselves in the riches of Christ, the less we will find ourselves enticed by all the marshmallows and fluff and filler in the world. 
As the old hymn goes, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Would you pray with me? Dear Father God, we turn to you now, recognizing that you are the great creator and sustainer of our souls. As we open up your words to learn from the life of your servant Joseph, God, help us to be mindful of the many, many temptations we battle every day. Fill us with faith. Fill us with contentment and fill us with joy in Jesus Christ who you sent to battle and overcome temptation, sin, and death itself. God, let the lure from the things of earth grow dim in our hearts so that we might rest more satisfied in you. By your Holy Spirit, God, we ask that you speak to our hearts and minds so that we might put your word into action. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, when it comes to temptation in the lives of Joseph and his brothers, the book of Genesis couldn't have a more direct application for us today. Overcome temptation or temptation will overcome you. Overcome temptation or temptation will overcome you. In our message, we're going to survey three kinds of temptation that Joseph overcame in his life. Now, fighting temptation means recognizing that we're fighting daily battles in a lifelong war. And the enemy wants you to think that you can't win this war. But you can. And we see that from the life of Joseph. So for each kind of temptation that Joseph faced, we're going to look for specific biblical tactics Joseph used to overcome that temptation in his life. And then at the end of the message, we're going to look at a tried and true strategy for defeating any kind of temptation that may be in your life. So the first kind of temptation Joseph overcomes is desire. Now, not all desire is evil. There are godly desires like desiring hope in a bad situation or desiring to do good to others or desiring to worship God like we're here today to do. But there's nothing wrong here with these godly desires, but what we really got to watch out for are wicked desires. These desires take all kinds of twisted forms. Lust for a sexual sensation. Greed for a fatter wallet. Envy for what others have and you don't have. When wicked desires form in our heart, they pull us away from the godly desires that God wants us to pursue. If you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and open them up to Genesis 39. And here we perhaps find one of the most obvious instances of temptation in Joseph's life. Uh, The wicked desire that Joseph faces here is lust from Potiphar's wife. And so follow along now as I read here, Genesis 39, 6 through 12. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. He has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph, day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by the garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Temptations to sexual sin and temptations to financial sin have led many marriages to ruin. Potiphar's wife was a temptress. Potiphar himself was a wealthy man. 
and I'm sure dinner conversations were a real pleasure to attend between them. Joseph finds himself in a serious predicament here. Even though God has given him favor with his master Potiphar, a slave can't just accuse his master's wife of adultery. The word of a slave doesn't hold out against the word of your master. Joseph can't just say, hey, master, I just want you to know, I think your wife's been hitting on me for a couple of months now. It's not going to go over very well. Even if Joseph's accusation was true, which it would have been, word getting out about this accusation would sour his master's reputation in Egypt. He's the captain of the guard. He's married to an adulterer. How would that look? In that sense, Joseph would also fail his duty as a slave. Additionally, a slave like Joseph can't just quit and go get another job. Talk about a real crucible or a catch-22. Many times when we read about Joseph and Potiphar's wife, we jump too quickly to verse 12 where Joseph flees. And we forget the fact that Joseph had to face this temptation day after day, according to verse 10. So how does Joseph overcome daily sexual temptation? Well, Joseph's example teaches us a couple of tactics, and we're just going to kind of work through them in the text. First, we are told Joseph refused. Joseph flat out refused. However, he didn't just say no. He explained in detail to Potiphar's wife how acting upon temptation would lead him and Potiphar's household to ruin. And then Joseph tells her that acting on lust would cause him to betray his master. And even worse, it would cause him to sin against the God who had given him favor with his master to begin with. Joseph didn't just think about the consequences Joseph gave himself power against the temptation by putting consequences into real, concrete words. Then, when Potiphar's wife persisted in her temptation, Joseph didn't engage her in debate. He didn't entertain her in conversation. He didn't spend any unnecessary time around her. The text says, day after day, he would not listen to her. You cannot reason with temptation. Joseph didn't give temptation a single inch because if it can, temptation will try to take an entire mile from you. Lastly, Joseph's example teaches us that if we really want to overcome temptations to wickedly satisfy unfulfilled desires, we have to be willing to make sacrifices. When Joseph was ambushed by Potiphar's wife, he was literally caught in an adulterer's clutches, he left his garment in her hand and fled. Joseph had such a profound devotion to his master and to God That for him, it was better to lose his dignity, lose it all, and end up in prison than to succumb to even one temptation. Now, most of us aren't blessed like Joseph. We don't have men and women constantly fawning over our naturally ravishing good looks. (laughs) And if you do, be sure you don't let your appearance consume you in vanity like Potiphar's wife. Don't end up hungry for the attention of others, starving for cheap thrills, and become blind to the truth and deaf to reason like she did. Control your temptation or your temptation will control you. What many of us do have is the power of instant gratification. Unfulfilled desires, desires for lust and greed, are just a couple computer clicks away for most. If you battle these kinds of desires, especially on a daily basis, your tactic against temptation is very simple. Refuse, 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 and flee. Just like Joseph, refuse, 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 and flee. Even if it costs you your dignity, 
your reputation, or all that you have. In God's eyes, it's better to be a godly man with nothing or a godly woman who's all alone than to be a marshmallow eater who thinks they have it all. The myth of King Midas is one of my favorites. As the story goes, King Midas was a man consumed by desires, and he wanted wealth that was beyond imagination. Consumed by his greed, King Midas prayed. He prayed day after day to attain the power to turn anything he touched into gold. And one day, he finally received the golden touch. At first, King Midas was delighted by this incredible power, and he began touching everything that he could. Golden crowns, golden rings, golden furniture, everything gold. But like all fables, King Midas didn't count the cost. He failed to see the concrete consequences of his, of his greed. And he discovered soon that he couldn't eat anything without turning his food into gold. He couldn't drink anything without turning his water into gold into gold. And on one terrible occasion, his daughter surprised him with a hug, and he turned her too into gold. King Midas soon died, a wealthy man, hungry, thirsty, and full of regrets. Don't end up like King Midas. Wicked desires are like prospecting for fool's gold. Even if you attain it, They will destroy your life trying to get them, and then they'll destroy your life once you have them. If you want to overcome wicked desires in your heart so that you can more fully embrace godly desires from Christ, don't let your temptations overcome you. Overcome your temptation. Refuse, 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 and flee. The second kind of temptation Joseph overcomes is one he faces throughout his whole life, and this is the temptation of power. In Spider-Man, Uncle Ben tells Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. And that's because those who attain power, attain positions of influence, status, authority, and strength, powerful people will be tempted to use their power primarily to benefit themselves rather than to benefit others. However, what we see in the life of Joseph is really something special. Joseph is a godly man who shows that, it can be, that you can be powerful without being sinful. And that's because God often grants authority, influence, and status so that those who have power can be a benefit to others. If you have your Bibles, we're going to survey now Joseph's career as a slave, a prisoner, and as royalty. And along the way, we're going to see a pattern emerge in Joseph's life that kept him from abusing power for himself and inspired him to use his power for others. So go ahead, if you're still there in Genesis 39, we're going to look at verses 1 to 4. And we're going to take a look at Joseph's initial experience as a slave in the house of Potiphar. Uh, Verses 1 to 4 say... Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, remember that there, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Remember that one too? So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. Now from these verses, there's just three observations about Joseph's slavery experience that I want you to remember. Again, first we're told the Lord was with Joseph. Second, we're told the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. And third, we're told Potiphar made him overseer of his house. This forms a threefold pattern. The Lord was with Joseph in slavery. The Lord made Joseph the most successful slave that he could be, 
and Potiphar made Joseph his overseer. We're going to see this pattern again now. So let's look at Genesis 39, down the page at verses 20 to 23. Despite Joseph's success as Potiphar's slave and overseer, Joseph again knew that it would be better to lose it all and trust God than to abuse his power or succumb to temptation. He gets thrown in prison, and this is what we learn about Joseph as a prisoner. Verses 20 to 23 say, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Again, the same threefold pattern. The Lord was with Joseph in prison. The Lord made Joseph the most successful prisoner that he could be, and the prison keeper made Joseph his overseer. Let's now turn to Genesis 41, 37 to 42. And for those of you that remember the story, Pharaoh learns Joseph the prisoner can interpret dreams. After Joseph successfully interprets Pharaoh's dream about coming years of harvest and famine, he receives a radical promotion. He goes from criminal to royalty. Verses 37 to 42 say, This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. This time, the threefold pattern takes a bit of a different nuance. Instead of his work as a faithful slave... Instead of his work as a faithful prisoner, Pharaoh praises Joseph for his work as a faithful prophet from God, a prophet who can interpret dreams. Pharaoh declares the spirit of God was with Joseph. Pharaoh declares God is the source of Joseph's prophetic power and success. And Pharaoh rewards Joseph by making him the royal overseer. If you're out there and you want to become someone who uses power, status, and your authority to benefit others, then the application from this threefold pattern should be fairly straightforward. Like Joseph, you must walk with God. You must acknowledge everything comes from God. And finally, this is the hardest part, you must wait on God. If you want to overcome the temptation to abuse power, no matter what your position in life may be, whether you're a prisoner or second to the king, Joseph teaches us that we must be content today and give God tomorrow. Be content today, give God tomorrow. God supplied Joseph with everything he needed to be godly and successful in his present situation. God supplies all of us with everything that we need to be godly and successful in our present situation. But the thing about power is that it can tempt us to desire status, desire influence and authority in the future that God has not yet given us. Power can tempt us to become so consumed with the future, a future fantasy in some sense, that we neglect our faithfulness in the presence. In ancient times, what you wore said a lot about your status in society and how much power you had. Joseph wore the expensive, colorful coat of an heir 
because he really was his father Jacob's favorite son. He then wore the coat of a slave because he was his master's property. He then wore nothing at all because his godliness mattered more than his dignity. That led him to wearing the chains of a prisoner because he was a convicted criminal. And finally, in Genesis 41, we're told he wore Egyptian garments of linen and gold because he had ascended to royalty. No matter what clothing Joseph wore, Joseph didn't let the status or power it represented change who he was. Joseph was the same godly servant in the colorful coat, the slave's coat, with no coat in prisoner's chains as he was in the royal coat. Joseph was content to walk with God. Joseph was content to rely on God for his success. And Joseph was content to wait on God for his future. Even though Joseph would be betrayed by just about every person who actually had power over him, a manipulative father, dysfunctional older brothers, his master seductive wife, an inept forgetful prisoner, Joseph's life demonstrates it was all worth it. It was all worth it in the end to faithfully wait on God for what he would, re would receive. And as we'll see, this is why Joseph never used his power to get even with anyone who had wronged him. So, if you're struggling to be satisfied with where God has you now, and you find yourself tempted to use power to help yourself get ahead at the expense of others, you need to refuse, 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 be content today, and give God tomorrow. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself and you're going to lead others into the third kind of temptation that Joseph faced, revenge. Revenge is the temptation to get even. And the seeds of revenge get planted when people succumb to the first two kinds of temptation. When someone else desires something that we have and tries to take it from us, we're tempted to get revenge. When someone else abuses their power to get ahead at our expense, we're tempted to get revenge. If anyone has the right to get revenge, it's definitely Joseph. But rather than getting even with all those who wronged him, we see that Joseph chooses instead to provide for them. In Genesis 45, we reach kind of the big reveal, the big climax of the narrative. And up until this point, Joseph has kind of kept his identity a secret. As the readers were left to wonder whether Joseph is finally going to get revenge on his family for all that they did to him. And we're told this in verses 2 through 5 and 11. And Joseph wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. I will provide for you. For there are yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. You know, almost ironically, Joseph is here and he has now more wealth, status, and power from Egypt than he would have ever attained had he actually received the inheritance rights of Jacob's firstborn son. It's why the text tells us that his brothers were dismayed at his presence. They were terrified because they saw Joseph through their own sinful experience. Had any one of his other brothers been there on the throne, they would have used the opportunity to get revenge, to get even. 
They could not fathom a reality that the brother they tried to murder would show them grace. Joseph is not like his brothers. In the midst of a global catastrophe, a worldwide famine, Joseph no longer needs nor cares about who gets what from the family inheritance. What he desires most is his family's love. So rather than getting even, rather than getting revenge, rather than getting mad, Joseph gets glad. And Joseph's tears are tears of joy. And his love for his family and faithfulness to God motivates him not to get revenge, but to provide for his family and to preserve their lives. You know, if you're struggling with the temptation to get even, even if you had a dysfunctional family try to murder you, sell you into slavery because of a manipulative parent, even if that's you, don't let other people's sins rob you of your joy in life. Just like the commercial, don't get mad, get glad. Everybody's now going to go buy those trash bags this afternoon. The real reason that we don't have to get mad, the real reason that we don't have to get even is because God vindicates the righteous. God will get better justice for us in the end than we can ever get for ourselves. Joseph doesn't get mad because he knows God is faithful and that he's orchestrating all things for the good of those who love him. So that same tactic is true for us if we want to overcome this temptation. Don't get mad. Get glad because one day God is going to make all things right. From the life of Joseph, we learn that there are really two paths. You can either overcome temptation or you can let temptation overcome you. The fight against temptation is more than just a battle of your will, though. God models for us specific biblical tactics in the lives of faithful servants like Joseph that we can use to win battles against temptations in our life. So I hope that the tactics we've explored from Joseph's life are helpful for you against any of the temptations you might face. Remember, against desire, we must refuse and flee. Against power, we must be content today and give God tomorrow. And against revenge, we must get glad, not even. So why does all of this matter, though? Well, to paraphrase a Puritan named John Owen, who wrote an awesomely titled book named The Mortification of Sin, our souls and our lives are at stake when it comes to sin and temptation. That's why he says this, always be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. Always be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. Even though we live in a fallen and broken world, we don't have to live our lives defeated. The power of Christ gives us hope. It gives us hope and it sets us free so that we can live victorious against temptation. So as we close this message out, I want to give you a tried and true battle plan to conquer sin in your life. This strategy is active offense, by the way. It's not going to work if you plan to play passive defense. But if you want to turn the tide against temptations in your life, if you want to really see sin's power pushed away, I really want to challenge you to put this strategy into use today. If you're tired of temptation overcoming you, and you want to overcome temptation for a change, you need to realize first that you're in a spiritual battle, yet God has given you the ability and the power to win, and there are three ways that you can attack temptation. Know it, stalk it, kill it. Know your temptations, stalk your temptations, kill your temptations. Always be killing sin or sin will be killing you. In the art of war, one of the greatest advantages that you can have is to know your enemy. You need to know who your enemy is. You need to know what your enemy does. And you need to know why your enemy does it. Perhaps your enemy is envy. This is who your enemy is. And what your enemy does 
is stir up feelings of jealousy and resentment towards those who get attention while you get overlooked. Why does envy do this? Well, her master is Satan, and the devil wants to see you become an agent of division in the workplace and in your home, rather than God's agent of reconciliation. First, know your temptations. Give them words, give them a name, make them concrete. Second, stalk your temptations. Just like the United States military intelligence constantly watch and survey your enemy. Always know your temptations, movements, and whereabouts so that you can be prepared like Joseph when temptation comes. Stalking your temptation is as simple as learning and watching for when, where, and how temptation strikes. If you're like Joseph and you know you're going to be tempted by lust, you know it. Don't be a victim and don't be a bystander. Become a spiritual soldier and prepare yourself for when, how, and where lust strikes. Does lust attack you when you're alone or with a particular person? If so, be watchful. Does lust attack you in a particular place, like a computer or a smartphone screen? If so, be watchful. Does lust attack you with a particular lie that promises to satisfy you, but it just causes you to want more? If so, get smarter than your sins. Know it, stalk it, and then kill it. The way that most of us are going to win the greatest spiritual battles against evil on this side of heaven is simply by learning to kill our sins. If you're a true Christian, then Jesus Christ has made you a conqueror, not a victim. You are a conqueror over evil, and you can crucify your sins. And the way that you kill your sin is to refuse, refuse, refuse. Just like Joseph and Potiphar's wife, or like Jesus being tempted in the wilderness by the devil, again and again, God will call us all to refuse our sins on a daily basis. When you do so, you weaken their power, and God will reveal to you even greater enemies in your heart when you're ready, and you'll get to battle against them too. Like us, Joseph is just a man. Like us, Joseph is not perfect. However, he is an imperfect man that God put into the Bible to show us that it is possible to win battles against your temptations. Just like Joseph, there are going to be moments that we fail. But even when we lose one battle to temptation, we don't have to give up the game. We don't have to lose the war. We don't have to give up that good fight. And that's because we have a savior. We have a savior who has already endured every temptation and has suffered the judgment for every sin on our behalf. Jesus has won the war for you and for me. And he's won it in such a way that you don't have to wait for his return. You don't have to wait for final judgment before you can start winning battles every day against temptation for his glory. If you've trusted Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in your heart, then the power of Christ is in you, and you can overcome temptation, and you can win. As God's word declares in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. Apart from Christ, temptation will overcome you. But with Christ, you will overcome temptation. Let's pray. Gracious God, 
We confess that our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep for us to undo. God, forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment in our conscience. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. God, open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. 